My name is Emma Smith Blanton, and I am 74 years old. At the time that I started my first job, it was at Good Samaritan Hospital, and I was a trade girl. Started as a trade girl, then later went to UK um, Medical Center Hospital, and that's where I pretty much got my start and my foundation for livelihood. But I did uh, attend college, attended Kentucky State University for two and a half years, but fell in love. So therefore, I got married. My husband was drafted in the Viet Vietnam War. So therefore, it was like a rush thing. So I dropped out of school at that time. And here we are. But I went back and got my teacher certification. But that was through the foundation that University Hospital set for me. I think it was maybe a dollar fifty or a dollar twenty five per hour. Yeah. But I love Trey Girl. It was fun. Yeah. So yeah, I think it was that. About a dollar fifty. And our fun activity, recreation, and all was right there at Charles Young Center. And what type of activities? Oh, you know, have? like we would do little dances. Here comes the lady from Germany, Germany. And remember that one? Do you remember that one? Okay, see, I'm a little older than you are, too. But, um,. That one, and we were into arts and crafts. We did a little bit of everything. We played basketball because you got to remember, Charles Young had a big gym there, and uh, therefore we got to play a lot of games. How were the stores and restaurants? Oh, honey, they were great. I can recall all the stores on Third Street because that was the main focus for us rather than Main Street. Because Third Street was right in my neighborhood. I was raised on Northeastern, right across from the Elks Club. And so the stores that I attended, or my grandmother and mother sent me to, uh, were Third Street Meat Market. There was a store called Glasses. There was Mr. Stilts, who had a fruit stand on another corner. And then there was Cottrell's Bakery, where my Uncle Emmett actually worked at the bakery, and we would get day-old donuts that he would bring home. And as far as family, it was like, you know, the saying, it takes a village to raise a child, and that's what we were. Our community from uh, Charles Young Park all the way over to my street, the neighbors watched out for each other. You could leave the doors open. You could leave your windows up. No one would break in or anything like that. And I was raised by my mother and grandmother. My mother was um, a deaf mute. So, therefore, we learned sign language. And my grandmother was like the father figure of the family. She kept things in place and kept things running. But I had a good family. I wouldn't trade it for nothing in this world. We had hard times, though. But we were a poor family because my mother did domestic work, and so did my grandmother. What was the political climate like in relationship to significant, significant events that affected the community? You know what? And that's strange that you said that because it was like politics... White versus blacks, none of that took place that I know of because my grandmother and mom never talked about it. It was some, uh, my grandmother worked for Mr. Courtney, who was vice president of First National Bank, and my mother worked for, oh, uh, God, what was the name of that family? But anyway, it was never discussed. We were our own separation. And did we mingle with other races? No, we didn't. We were just our own little entity. People that we played with in the neighborhood, anywhere from Charles Young Center all the way down to Lyric Theater, that was our activities. So politics was not even 
But I saw things. Say like for recreation, the Greyhound bus station. I don't know if you remember where it still exists. Old Greyhound bus station was our recreation. Mom would take us, walk us through, and we would use the bathrooms and things like that. And see, the bathrooms were, for blacks were filthy. But then for the white, it was totally different. It was clean. But our bathrooms were never clean. And then we had to pay to get in one that was clean. They had the chicken shack. They had the palace. They had a hole in the wall. They had, um, what other one? Oh, God, they had so many. They had so many restaurants and barber shops and shoe shops, shoe repair shops, cleaners. All of that existed on Dewey Street. Dewey Street was like another part of the city, of the community that we all frequent. Do you have a favorite memory of growing up here? Oh, God, yeah. I have a lot of memories. You know, my mother, bless her heart, for our recreation on a Sunday, every Sunday, in the evening after we had gone to church and maybe taken in a movie, because movies were 10 cents at Lyric, we would go shopping. And at that time, you know, all the uh, dress stores and all the shoe stores and all those things did not open on Sunday. So we would go window shopping. And that was the best fun because then we would circle around and come up Dewey Street and there was Mr. Garner's ice cream shop. Did you spend much time in West End? Not that often. i tell you why, but one holiday was the biggest event for West End. Everybody would flock to Douglas Park. And that's where you would have your festivities. Everybody bring their food and picnic. We have a big old gathering and just sit down and enjoy one another. But Douglas Park was the only place that we would go to and were allowed to go to. But it was a fun day, and it was always 4th of July. Every year, 4th of July. Yes. Living on Northeastern, I grew up. There, I was actually born on Thomas Street when there were houses. And then when Urban Renewal came through, they tore down the houses and then my grandmother had to find a place. And that's when she found the house on Northeastern for all of us. But um, I remember all the... When you said when Urban Renewal, what was built there when they brought you us? The projects. Yes. Aspendale. Thomas Street. They built all around Shallow Baptist Church because Shallow Baptist Church existed on Thomas Street. And Reverend uh, T.H. Smith, which was my cousin, later found out, uh, he uh, baptized us. But then, you know, back in the day, a lot of things was hush-hush. But yes. Any thoughts you'd like to leave us with? If I had it to do all over again, I would still want the same parents. I would still want the same neighborhood. I would still want the little shotgun house that we lived in. I still would want the outdoor facilities. We didn't have indoor facilities. We had outdoors. Have you ever seen an outhouse? Okay. There was outhouses when I was coming up. So therefore... All of that has inspired me to be where I am today. We stay focused. Education was a key. My brother, like I said, taught French and Spanish, and I taught elementary. And I still go back into the school system and do a little subbing every now and then because it gives me joy. Children are joy, and they bring peace within your life. Hey, my name is William Hunter Wilson. Uh, I was born here in Lexington, Kentucky, and I'm 77 years old. Okay. And I noticed you said Hunter in there. Yes. Is that significant? It is. Work? From a historical perspective, it is. I was delivered by the first one of the first African-American doctors in this community, Dr. Bush Hunter. 
And so my parents named me after him since he delivered me. And the neat thing about it was when I got sick when I was young, he would come, you know, in those days doctors made house calls. So every time he would come for any kid that was named after him, he gave him a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, can you just give us a little background uh, about yourself and growing up here in Lexington? Sure. I was, uh, like I said, I was born here in Lexington, Kentucky. I was born in what they call the uh, St. Joseph Hospital. And that day and age, you were, you were born in the colored wing of St. Joseph Hospital, and that's where I was. Uh, my parents are from, uh, my mother's from Richmond, Kentucky, Kirksville more specifically which is a small community outside of, uh, of, of Richmond. My father's from Harrisburg, Kentucky, and they met at Kentucky State, and of course they married, and then here I come. And so I was born here, or raised here. I went uh, first to Douglas Elementary School, and then I went from Douglas Elementary to Lexington Junior. Uh, the interesting thing there was is that I was one of the first African Americans that went to Lexington Junior. My mother didn't tell me at the time, but she used me as a social experiment. They were looking for African Americans to help integrate Lexington Junior High School. And so she didn't ask me whether I wanted to go. She simply said, this is something you need to do. And I said, well, I'm not sure what that meant. But when I got there, I found out a whole lot of things. But be that as it may, I went to Lexington Junior High School. And now they don't call them junior high schools, they call them middle schools. After that, I decided that I'd like to uh, get involved in more in activities and things. And one specific activity I really wanted to get involved with was the band. So I went and transferred from Lexington Junior. And normally I would have gone to Henry Clay, but it was in the city, so Dunbar was there. So I went to Dunbar High School. And there I stayed until I graduated in 1963 in Lexington. It was challenging sometimes when I grew up. I grew up in a little place called on, on Childs Avenue. Uh, there were three streets, Breathitt, Florence, and Childs. I mentioned Childs because the school, Douglas Elementary, was right up the street. I could walk to school easily every day, and I could even come home for lunch and go back to school. That's how close the school was. It was wonderful living in this community because it was the first time, and I didn't appreciate it at the time, but this is when community really came in. Everybody on our street and in that area knew each other. We had no, I don't think, but there was only one or two families that had telephones. Nobody had a television set except my neighbor across the street, whom I adopted as my uncle and aunt because I wanted to see their television set. Uh, we didn't have indoor bathrooms. Uh, it was pretty sparse, if you will, but you know something? Those were the happiest days of my life. I had no idea. Uh, we would, some people would look and say, well, you all were really poor, and we may have been, but I never knew that because I never missed a meal as such. Uh, we had great neighbors, and it was a kind of a community spirit that I didn't understand. Uh, when people got into trouble, I could see my mother and grandmother fixing up an extra pot of food, and I'd be asking her, well, we don't have that many people eating here. She said, well, I'm going to give some to so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so. and I never understood the reason why she was doing that, because that Miss so-and-so and so-and-so didn't have any food. So my mother and my grandmother frequently cooked for other people in the community without my knowledge. All I knew was is that I had a full meal. I was eating every day, and I knew that people were just friendly. Uh, people would come to the house and they'd knock on the door and my grandmother would say, come on in, you know, the doors were never locked. Uh, people would come and they'd come in and if they saw you doing something, they'd stop and help you. It was a real community and I didn't appreciate that until I got older. And when I got older, I found out how some people live next door to each other for their lifetime and they don't know their neighbors, they don't know their neighbors, anything about them. But in our case, we knew everybody we had uh, uh, parties and things that long before they had so-called formal block parties. My grandmother and mother used to make these pies and things, and they, I'd go up and down the street and sell a pie today that you'd buy for thirty dollars. They'd sell them for a dollar just to help out the community and to do things. 
We had no telephones, no TVs, no street lights. And yet there was not a single soul in our community that was ever attacked or felt out kilter. In other words, my whole, that whole street was my neighborhood. And at nighttime when the sun went down and, every, and it was pitch black outside, we'd play hide and go seek. And the whole street, we could run up and down that whole street and not have one fear of being hurt, harmed, anything. Secondly, everybody on that street was my parent. They knew me and I knew them. And they made sure that William Hunter stayed straight. And if it was time for me to go home, they said, William Hunter, it's time for you to leave. And I said, yes, ma'am. And I'd go on down to my house, just as though someone had put a leash on me and took me straight to my house. So I love the idea of community. It was a really good time for me. It was a good time for uh, the people that I worked with and the people that I knew. So I, I enjoyed that. And I'm missing that element of community in today. You touched on it a little bit, but can you tell us about uh, recreation, entertainment, uh, social settings, those type things? Oh, I'd love to. Uh, one of the things that we talk about today is that there needs to be more connection between parents and the teachers. And in my day, my teacher, my first, second grade teacher, played bridge with my mother attended the church where my mother went. In other words, it was a connection there that everybody nowadays finds unusual. You can't find teachers today that are spending time in the community as much as some of our teachers did. And so I remember very well that uh, bridge playing and card playing was a big Saturday night function. And the people who would be in there would be my principal and my my, my, my teacher, my teacher for the first and second grade was the same teacher, and so I, I learned a lot from that. I, other major social activities would be uh, going to the show. We used to love to go to the Lyric. We'd go over to the Lyric about 10 in the morning, and they'd have this thing called uh, 20 cartoons and three big features. And we'd be in there in the Lyric Theater from 10 o'clock in the morning until 6 o'clock in, in the afternoon. And we would do a lot of things at the Lyric. The Lyric almost became the cultural center for all of us. I saw some outstanding musicians for whom I never knew anything. I didn't know anything about a Count Basie or a Duke Ellington. But my parents took me there to listen to them play and to be a part of it. The first ebony fashion show that I ever saw in my life was at the Lyric Theater. And so it was a cultural thing that we really enjoyed. The Lyric, beside the Lyric, the only other theater we could go to was the Ben Ally. But you had to go in the back door and you had to sit upstairs in the balcony, which I found to be quite enjoyable. I'd rather sit in the balcony anyhow <laughs> rather than sitting on the floor. But I did not know at the time, per se, that the reason I was sitting in the balcony was because of the color of my skin. I had no choice, but I didn't mind it at, at all. So we went to the show. Uh, we were there some other places in the community. I remember when the first skating rink opened up and oh my goodness, I've never seen such talented people. All I could do is very well learn how to just circumvent the circle without falling down. But there were some people there that could dance on skates and they were really, really good. And that was something else. A lot of social engagements had to do with parties, uh, block parties, uh, things. Uh, we used to go to a place called Charlotte Court. And the rooms there were not necessarily big, but you'd get people stuffed in there and they'd be out in the yard and all over the place. But again, there were no problems. We didn't have any fights. Uh, there was no shootings or anything. And we'd all just go to the parties, have a good time, and then go home as such. So our social events evolved around the lyric, evolved around the community. And the other social event place that took place was around churches. Uh, I used to attend a lot of, but my mother used to drag me to these things called basket meetings and conventions and things. And gosh, I hated it because I'd sit in church all day. But one of the things I loved, I loved their lunches and their dinners. And I would be in there because they, they could really eat and I loved to eat. And I tell you, I just had myself the best time of my life. So those were some of the social things we did. We manufactured, for example, we didn't have skateboards 
So we made our own skateboards. We take a, a box that we got at the a and P market and we put a slab under it and put skates on the front and back and we scoot. That was our first scooter and such. We would take bicycles and take pick, uh, 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 cardboard and put in the back of them. And so as a wheel would spin, it would make it sound as though you were riding a motorbike. We had all very ingenious ways of doing kinds of things and uh, to entertain ourselves as such. So we had a good time. I like a, a lot of things. I'd like to see a more, the, the community spirit that we had back when we didn't have a lot of stuff, I, I'd like to see that come back. I like the idea of a community because I think there's power in the community and I'd like to see the community spirit return to, I hate to say it, the good old days. I'd like to see that uh, come about. I'd also like to see more educational opportunities and I'd like to see young ladies especially look at getting involved with the sciences, biology, psychology, math, and what have you. I'd like to see uh, more young ladies getting involved. Now statistically, there are more young ladies attending college than there are men. But sometimes the courses are, are, are not quite as rigorous. So I'd like to see the women think in terms of becoming astrophysicists. And it gives me great joy when I see someone can become a surgeon and, and what have you. Because these are fields that women have not been readily in, involved in and accepted in. So I'd like to see some opening of doors and more opportunities for all people, no matter what your nationality, no matter whether you're Jew, Gentile, black, white, blue, green, yellow, no matter what. And I'd specifically like to see more women get involved with the STEM, become engineers and medical doctors. That is not to say that if you become a teacher or a plumber or anything, that that's bad. But I always believe that you should raise the value of that. In other words, if you're going to be a teacher, then be the best teacher that you can possibly be. Be the, you know, I, I work with a group called the Black Achievers. And one of the things we'd always ask young people, what do you want to be? They say, well, we want to be doctors and lawyers. Why? Because it's more money. I said, well, it doesn't matter what field you choose. If you are really good at it, you can make it. So if you're thinking that if you want to be a sanitation engineer, then own all the sanitation trucks. Own the company, you know. So I like to see a, an attitude of being able to accomplish great things embedded in people. And I'd like to see more people of color and more people involved in things so that they can see that if you work hard and if you do these kinds of things, that the world is, a, is really an oyster and you can really go after it. You can really deal with it. So I'd like to see com more community spirit. I'd like to see more opportunities for young ladies and girls. I'd like to see, period, more people taking advantage of the sciences. And uh, I, th I think that if we could do that and just follow one basic line of, of scripture, and that is just to love one another, I think we could deal with this. Many times people feel uh, that uh, they don't understand that failure is the first, su first step to success. Uh, people take failure as a point of, well, I can't do it, and it's defeating. And yet, that's the way you learn. And the one thing I'd like to do, I mean, I have had some colossal failures in my life. But the good news is I've always had support groups, people who would come and say, well, you messed up that time, but here's some of the things you need to do to improve. And so one of the areas that I was very, very poor at at the beginning was writing. And then all of a sudden I kept, they said, don't worry about it. You, you're not going to get anything written the first time as well as it can be written. You've got to rewrite. You've got to be able to accept criticism as a part of that, constructive criticism. So people started guiding me. And then this is when I started writing and I wrote this book I was telling you about. It was picked up by the Cambridge Publishing Company. I never thought that I could do that type of thing. But I learned to do that because I failed. I, something else I learned, I, I failed at miserably and, and what have you, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> at one time, the most frightening thing that people can have is public speaking. They do not like to speak in public. Now, 
It's amazing. I couldn't sing worth a squat. I can't carry a tune to this day. So whenever I got into a position where I was in a play, they'd always give me the speaking part. They forced me because of something I couldn't do to excel in something that I was not really good at, but I had to develop because they wouldn't have gonna allow me to sing. That was for sure. But they would allow me to speak. But that took practice. Uh, and it took failure and it took times when I didn't do the right thing and couldn't say the right thing, got confused. And, and I looked up one time and, and it was amazing. I was in uh, West Virginia. <laughs> and when I got up to speak, there were 2000 people in that auditorium. And it dawned upon me at that moment, Wilson, I remember when you couldn't speak to five folks. <laughs> without getting terribly nervous. And then I remember a person who was my speech teacher at Dunbar High School. She said to me, there are two types of nervousness. The first nervousness is the kind you don't want to have. And that is when you're unprepared. If when you're unprepared, that nervousness is a fright, it's scary. But the good type of nervousness is when you're prepared, you're psyched up, you have your game face on. You know what you're supposed to do, but you still are nervous. She says, that's good because that means you have a respect for your audience. So always remember to respect your audience. And to this day, no matter how many people I speak in front of, I always have a few jitters before I get up. And once I get up and start rolling, it's something else. But it's always that respect for the audience. But the thing that my teacher told me, you cannot do anything unless you're prepared. And if you're not prepared, that's when you're most likely to meet a, a, a less than the success that you've had. So I always encourage people, no matter who they are, where they are, that no matter what field you go into, you've got to discipline yourself. You've got to prepare for that. You can't expect the stuff to come by osmosis. It only comes by hard work. And that's the lesson that you want to learn. But I learned a lot from my failures, and I just uh, I enjoyed all the people who came who came and gave me constructive criticism. That is, they weren't trying to tear me down, but they were trying to build me up. And the best thing that I could have done was listen and try to be coachable. That's important when you're in television because there is no such thing as a perfect script. I don't care how many times you've written it. When you turn a script in, people are gonna mark it up, chop it up, and so many times people let that impact their egos. You don't wanna have that. That's, people are not trying to hurt you personally. They're trying to get the best quality product that they possibly can get. So I learned one thing through failure, that you gotta have a little thick skin. You gotta be able to accept criticism and use that criticism as a launching pad for the things that you wanna do. I'm Anthony Beatty Sr. I'm 71 years old from Lexington, Kentucky. Okay. And can you tell us uh, just a little bit about yourself, background, who you are, what you did? Right. Uh, yes, we, uh, we, as I, we, I grew up in, the, uh, in Lexington, Kentucky, in the inner city of Lexington back in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, my family grew up, uh, we're from the rural part of the, the county, but we moved into the uh, Bluegrass Aspinel housing projects in the east end of Lexington uh, about 1955, 56. And so I grew up uh, there doing the, in the heat of the civil rights movement and all the things that were happening in our communities back during the 50s and 60s. Uh, went to local public high schools, uh, public uh, junior high school and then high school. Uh, did my undergraduate studies at Eastern Kentucky University, where I majored in police administration and a minor in human resource management. Uh, also, I went to uh, Kentucky State University, where I obtained a, a master's of public administration. And that uh, set the course for me to use during uh, my career. Uh, I had a law enforcement career here in this community, where I started, actually started my first job as a locksmith at the University of Kentucky. Became a police officer there for about one year. Uh, the urban county government, the city in Lexington merged in 1973, and at that time they hired uh, three classes of police officers. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get into one of those classes and get hired as a police officer. 
and uh, worked as a police officer with the Lexington Police Department for uh, several years, got promoted through every rank, uh, became chief of police in Lexington and the, the first African-American chief of police, I should say, in August of 2001. And uh, was, was uh, very happy to have the opportunity to serve Lexington in a, in a law enforcement capacity. So I did actually 35 years with Lexington Division of Police, uh, almost eight of those as chief. I retired from uh, the Lexington City Police, uh, became assistant vice president for public safety at the University of Kentucky. And I did that for 15 years and I recently retired from the University of Kentucky after 15 years. Uh, what was the entertainment or like sports and culture like that we used growing up? Right. Well, to, to answer that question, you have to picture the uh, growing up in a city like Lexington in the 50s and 60s, uh, the cultural opportunities, the sports activities, the entertainment was kind of focused in in the African American community for us because you got to remember that was during the time of segregation. And so there were not that many opportunities outside of our community for us to be involved in. Uh, but those communities, the community itself was a very enriching community, a very loving community. And so we created and had many opportunities for uh, cultural experiences, athletic opportunities, both in the, uh, the housing developments that we lived in and in the, uh, the African-American schools that we attended. And then there were entertainment venues throughout, peppered throughout our community here in the East End of Lexington. So we had places to go and things to do. I say we, but I mean our parents. We as young people didn't get to go to some of the entertainment venues, but we knew they existed. So even though our community was uh, segregated from the rest of our community of the city, uh, there was much to do. Uh, it was an enlightening experience. We had many, many parents and friends and family members who cared for us, looked out for us, and created opportunities for us. So we're very thankful for our what went on in Lexington back in the time that we grew up here. Was there any like, sort of like rec centers or any places you all do for fun? Yeah. Sure. Recreational opportunities were, were many. Uh, like I said, we created our home in the housing projects. We had uh, regular baseball games, and uh, we did, uh, we ran, we boxed, we had skating uh, 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 venues and opportunities for folks, bike riding, so recreation was big where we grew up. But then in the school system, uh, many of the, the kids there, and myself included, became athletes where we either played basketball, football, baseball, those things that happened in the public school system. So yeah, there was plenty of recreational opportunities that were created for us. Again, not many outside of our community. We didn't get to go out to the parks and the rest of the city of Lexington. Uh, we didn't get to go to the, the ball games at some of the other places, but we had our own events for, our, for ourselves and our families in our own community. Yes, we had those. Uh, social clubs were both uh, physical brick and mortar places, if I want to call them that. They were literally bars and clubs. But more, more importantly, I think, were the social clubs where that uh, people gathered in groups. For example, the women had groups, the men had groups, the families had groups, and those social clubs drove the activity, whether it was doing events in the park or going on trips or ha having uh, just having fun together. So there were both physical social clubs for businesses, but then there were many, many clubs of folks who gathered together and did things. And th those social clubs actually still somewhat exist in, in Lexington today uh, from the hub of those small groups some of the folks are still living or their, their, their family members are, and they still have the same kind of activities, take the trips, do the things together. So yeah, there were social clubs and events for us then. What was the political climate like? Uh, political climate in Lexington uh, at that time mirrored what was going on in the rest of the country. Uh, there was turmoil and strife, uh, I guess, discontentment among the, the citizens with not only with leadership in our community, with not only uh, the politicians, but just in general with each other and what was going on in our world. So a lot of frustration. So politics were critical and centered to everything that was going on. Uh, back to the civil rights movement, 
uh, the, at the center of all that was the politics of it. So how do we, how would change be made? Who would be the driving forces? What change would happen? All that was what made up the politics. So both Democrat, Republican, and Independent, and anyone else that wanted to be involved with making change stepped up and did it at that time. So there was uh, a lot of politics for, for the African-American in our community. Uh, the politics were, obviously we didn't have many people in positions that could make change. And so that meant that we had to protest to, to bring forward to light the things that we wanted to have changed. And that was the, that was the case. We had many protests here about what was going on uh, for us, both locally and, and nationally and politically. What was your favorite memory growing up? Favorite memory growing up would be, uh, I guess, just the whole the whole spirit of the community. Uh, you know, you would think, given all the, the the depression that we were dealing with in terms of segregation and not being able to get out and be exposed and knowing that some people had more and got to do more than you did because of the color of their skin, but we had this this whole community of people who were, who were nurturing, who cared for us, who thought about us. And we, we knew and understood that. We respected them and we sensed uh, their caring for us. So it was, it was not just our parents who were modeling us, but it was all those folks in our community. I always say that in, in terms of growing up in the African-American community in the 50s and 60s, it truly was the village. You hear all the time that it takes the village. And that's what it was. Everybody there from, the, from your parents to the janitor to school to the to your school teachers, the principals, the ministers, everybody there was shaping and molding us. And I always sensed that and always appreciated that later in life because I understood they they were the ones who showed us I actually stood on to be to be somebody different in life. So I was appreciative of how they did it. And that stands out more than anything, just the community, the, the sense of community. I don't think we have that anymore like we used to back then. And that really helped us to be who we are. Period. We're in the building. Through our eyes and our words, we're in the bigger picture. Playing seeds for the future, we're in the bigger picture. Community solutions, that's the bigger picture. And we ain't gotta hate, we can get the picture. Through our eyes and our words, we can change the climate. We gon' let you get the verbs, that's the perfect timing. Through our eyes and our words, we gon' speak the truth. In the class, in the street, who that's can enough. Be See the world through our lens, it's too real to pretend. Bring a violence to an end, that's enough. All the rage in this unity, we just put it out for our community. That's, that's enough. enough. CIS opportunity, we don't do truancy, action speak fluent. That's enough. You don't hear us, you gon' feel it as we speak it. You to light, hands down, we the realest. Through our eyes and our words, we're the bigger picture. Playing seeds for the future, we're the bigger picture. Community solutions, that's the bigger picture. And we ain't gotta hate, we can get it with you. Through our eyes and our words, we can change the climate. We got action, beat the verbs, that's the perfect timing. Through our eyes and our words, we gon' speak the truth. In the class, in the streets, in the booth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>